Hello, my name is John Davis. I'm the director of the Laboratory for Open Computer Architecture at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, I'd like to thank you for having me uh, at this uh, workshop today. I'll be talking about HPC opportunities, past, present, and future in a rapid succession. So first, what I'd like to do is just give you an overview of the past, um, one of the projects in particular, uh, and then talk about the present and then move into the future with a common theme of an open HPC system or ecosystem and how do we get there? And so I think that's the interesting thing to talk about. So going back about a decade, BSC started a project called Mont Blanc which was an HPC stack um, all around R. And what it was doing was coming up with this notion that we could use um, cell phone processors as the basis for a supercomputer. So based on ARM, in this case, it was Samsung processors at the time, uh, and then build a um, supercomputer from that, starting with the hardware, moving up to system software applications, and obviously targeting industrial applications. So we had this full stack that I'm showing here, with a bunch of different partners. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects was being able to put all this together in about three successive projects that uh, worked there. And so the exciting thing was there was an opportunity to work in all these level layers of the stack. You could change things in the applications, the industrial uh, user side uh, as a HPC center, uh, as well as the software system stack itself. All of those things could be changed from what got down to the hardware because it was uh, an ARM architecture. We were unable to change that. And so this is just a scenario where um, most of the parts of the stack above uh, the hardware were open, uh, but in this case, the actual hardware itself was proprietary. Now, fast forward to about a year ago, and we have this exascale race uh, where the Japanese have leveraged the uh, co-design of the Fujitsu systems for the Riken uh, Supercomputing Center. And so really they're looking at this co-design of the applications, the architecture, thinking about the number of SIMD units, the SIMD length, the vector length, number of cores, all of these different things to really drive a high performance uh, system. What, and the outgrowth of that, uh, based on the analysis bottlenecks and improving those, was the post-K A64FX processor, uh, which I'm showing here in this slide. And this is an exciting processor which has 48 cores. Each one has a couple of assistant OS cores. Um, it's based on the ARM V8.2 architecture. So it's a 64-bit ecosystem. Um, and it also supports uh, scalable vectors. And so you have this capability of getting both uh, mini core performance as well as vector performance from the same chip. And so this is a very exciting place uh, as we've gone from 10 years from where we were to here. And the fantastic thing about this is it currently is the number one in the top 500. And so that's an exciting place to be. We've gone from something that's been traditionally dominated by CPUs and GPUs to something that is a homogenous system. And so as we look at today, what we see uh, in the HPC space is that Europe is really leading uh, in terms of defining common open HPC software ecosystem where Linux is the de facto uh, standard operating system, uh, despite other proprietary alternatives like Windows or AIX or some of the others. And we're seeing this dominance of uh, open source across the entire landscape from cloud to IoT. And they're all enjoying these different benefits. Uh, so this gives us um, uh, open source software common platform specification interface. It can accelerate building new functionality by leveraging those existing components. It lowers the barrier, barrier to entry for other, others to contribute these new components. So it's easier to, to build new things or extend things. And we can crowdsource solutions for uh, both small and large problems. We have a number of people contributing. Now, what we see though is on the hardware side, in particular the CPU and the GPUs and ASICs, there's a big barrier to this holistic co design process. So there's barriers to inner, in innovation. And we're not even able to have those conversations in some cases. So we do see some opening of the um, hardware ecosystem and, and the concepts of the open compute uh, platform uh, and some of the interfaces being standardized, um, but that still doesn't mean that we can move down all the way down to uh, the CPUs, GPUs, and ASICs. So why is that important today? So today's technology trends are a combination 
different components. So I mentioned on the software side, we have massive penetration of open source software, everything from IoT, Arduino, all the way up to HPC with Linux, OpenMP, and other components. Likewise, when we look at the actual manufacturing side, the combination of the slowing of Moore's law plus the increased power densities are really focusing innovation on specialization. So how do we build special purpose hardware for the software? This ends up being more cost effective, higher performance, uh, and lower power. And so this is where we really reinforce this notion of software hardware flow design. And so when we look at that, there's this new paradigm of opportunities uh, when we look at uh, new open source hardware momentum from IoT to the Edge and HPC. And this is really categorized by uh, RISC V, which is about the same age as, say, the Mont Blanc pro project started in 2010, as well as Open Power uh, from IBM. So these are two different scenarios where we can leverage those. And today we're focusing more on the RISC V side, which has massive momentum. So going back uh, about a year in terms of looking at open source beyond 2020, uh, there was a DG Connect and DGIT workshop back in November of 2019, which really was starting to focus on what does the ecosystem mean for software hardware, uh, co-design in particular open source hardware. And we already see a massive mainstream uh, adoption of open source software. How do we do the same in open source hardware. And I think what we'll see is the ability to leverage both open source and proprietary solutions uh, and back and forth. And I think that's the exciting opportunity. So when we look at HPC for tomorrow, really I think uh, from a European perspective where I'm coming from, it's really how does Europe lead this open software hardware stack for the world? And particularly we can use RISC-V to provide that open source hardware alternative to what's traditionally been non-European solutions. And so there is an opportunity for Europe to play in this realm and achieve a complete technology independence, which has been a massive uh, driving force of, of late uh, to get to digital autonomy. And so we're currently obviously in the early stage of that. So how do we progress forward? And so let me give you a sketch of that in the next slide. But fundamentally, I think RISC-V can help unify focus and build a new microelectronics industry in Europe to help us drive that. So this entire stack that we're showing here on the right can be open from applications all the way down to hardware, whether that's GPUs, ASICs, or even CPUs. And I think that is in a very exciting outcome of this uh, opportunity for open source hardware. Now we don't live in a vacuum. And so if we look at the future, <clears throat> there's a near-term future tomorrow. And what do we build? And that's really building with what we have already. So this would be things like ARM, x86, and so forth, adding the software value add. And so this is applications. Uh, and again, open source provides us the ability to leverage those common interfaces, building blocks, and so forth. And I think the interesting aspect here is if we think about open source software, is it possible to also build in such a way that it's uh, architecture agnostic? Because then we can reuse it on different architectures. However, in a couple of years, what we're seeing is a broader support call for digital autonomy in Europe and other places. And so this is where I think this five falls in. Here we can have hardware added value. And this is in the context of specialization. So we can build application accelerators, special function units. All of these things can be um, demonstrated in the open source hardware and leverage the existing components. And so fundamentally, this gives us the ability to demonstrate them, uh, particularly from a research perspective, in these open source ecosystems. So what I'm showing there is this coupling of these two. So as we feed uh, from one side to the other, it raises the other side up. And so this five comes up as we add more in the software ecosystem. And likewise, the arm can be raised up as we look at a new hardware um, features that we've demonstrated. And so fundamentally, what that means is we can actually have them coexist depending on how we uh, work on them in the context of demonstrating from a software perspective, uh, architecture agnostic, agnostic software designs, as well as using hardware in the context of RISC-V to demonstrate research ideas, which then can be adopted by ARM uh, to move forward. So there's a very nice synergy there uh, between the two. With that, I thank you very much for listening to my talk. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the session.